Welcome to St. John's Lutheran Church, Springfield, Ohio. Today is the 1st of October of uh, 2017. Today is the 17th Sunday after Pentecost. We would like to wish a happy birthday, 96 years old, to uh, Nelson Kloppenstein. St. John's is located at 27 North Wittenberg Avenue, Springfield, Ohio. Our telephone number is 323-7508. St. John's Lutheran Church, Springfield, Ohio. This is the 17th Sunday after Pentecost, October the 1st, 2017. Our opening hymn, I Want to Walk as a Child of the Light, Fairly Modern Hymn, written by Kathleen Thomerson, who was born in 1934. Lutheran Hymn, I Want to Walk as a Child of the Light.
and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you.
consolation from love, any sharing in the spirit, any compassion and sympathy, make my joy, my joy complete. Be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness. And being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Therefore God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed me, not only in my presence, but much more now in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in you, enabling you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. The word of the Lord. We're singing the gospel acclamation as Pastor John Pollock, our pastor, is ascending the pulpit. We'll be reading the gospel. It's time for the gospel. We honor that. We all stand to Jesus' words. Pastor John Pollock, the pastor of our church.
sermon notes for today's Having the Mind of Christ. And our sermon text being our second reading, Paul's letter to the Philippians, the second chapter. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. As most of you are aware, I hope, that this year marks the 500th anniversary of the Reformation. <coughs> and of course, that was a time when the church was in turmoil and disagreement and ended up in division. That goes along with St. Paul writing to the Philippians today because he is giving us advice on how Christians can agree, can agree without having division and separation. And if only the leadership at the time of the Reformation had had the mind of Christ instead of the mind of the world, the split may not have ever happened. In fact, I have talked to a number of Catholic priests and theologians who say if Martin Luther were here today, there would have been no split then. The outlook and attitude of the papacy is totally different than that in 1570. So, can Christians disagree? And if so, how do they go about it? In the second verse of our second reading today, in that second chapter of Philippians, St. Paul asked that we, quote, be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Now on the surface, hearing that, you could say that St. Paul is telling us that we're supposed to always agree. That as Christians, we should be marching in lockstep with one another and not having any disagreements and divisions. But that's not exactly an accurate description of what St. Paul is saying. That he has given us guidelines as to how to handle those disagreements. And if we as Christians would truly have the mind of Christ, there would be a dramatic decline in divisions and problems within the Church of Jesus Christ. The problem is, all of us agree to having the mind of Christ. So, to have the mind of Christ, the first thing you must do is have a mind of humility. In the eighth verse of our reading today, St. Paul wrote, speaking of Jesus, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. He humbled himself. <coughs> humility. Now, the hard thing with humility today is if someone claims that they are humble or if they claim they have humility, they usually don't. They're just saying it to try to promote themselves. And on the other hand, we have too many people today who don't have humility because they have been taught from the beginning to look out for number one and to make themselves the most important and to be the top dog. So, what does it mean to be humble? What does it mean to be like Jesus and having that mind of Jesus in the sense of being humble? Well, the word literally means to make low, to reduce something, to assign to a lower rank or place, to be ranked below others who are honored. So it means that you are always stepping aside for someone else, not being run over, not being walked on. But simply you realize the priority of life through your faith in Jesus Christ and that the priority is not materialism. The priority of life is not power, prestige, popularity, or what we can grab and snatch. But that the priority is serving Jesus Christ as he served us. And Jesus served us as a humble servant. So we 
make ourselves low to others. We, as Jesus says, when you go to a wedding, don't sit at the top place because someone more important than you may come along and you move down to the lowest place. So instead of assigning yourself to what you think is the top place because you're so important, instead, see where the host asks you to sit or wait till everyone else is then take your seat. And so, Jesus, in order to be Savior of the world, left his throne in heaven and came down to us so that he could save us. He didn't come down to us to be just another religious teacher. He didn't come down to us to be a philosopher, among many philosophers. He came to us to save us, just as he told Nicodemus. John 3.16, the very first Bible verse I was taught to memorize. Maybe many of you were the same thing if you grew up in the Lutheran church. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, so that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting. In the next verse, God sent his son into the world not to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. That's considered the gospel in a nutshell. That is the foundation of Christianity. That is what makes Christianity different from the religions of the world. For God so loved the world. As I've told you many times, I grew up in Kentucky. And in the Commonwealth of Kentucky, the buckle of the Bible Belt, Kentucky is dominated by what we refer to as the fundamentalist churches. In your big cities, you have a lot of, quote, liturgical churches, Roman Catholic, Lutheran, Episcopalian, Methodist, Presbyterian. But out in the state, the more majority of fundamentalists. And so radio and TV were dominated by these fundamentalist churches as I grew up. And you would turn on the radio on a Saturday night and hear it start on Saturday night and going through Sunday until about noon. And then stations were allowed to switch to non-religious programming. Well, some of these fundamentalist preachers preached hellfire and damnation so effectively that they had you so terrified, you were afraid to get out of bed. Because to get out of bed, you were afraid you'd do something wrong that was going to send you to the devil and to hell. And so I would hear this on the radio constantly. But then I'd go to our little Lutheran church on the south side of Louisville, and I'd hear the pastor talking about God loving the world so much that he gave his only son. Not to condemn the world but that the world might be saved through him. And that is a message the world is longing for and aching for today. That God loved them, not that you're a sinner and that you have all kinds of problems and all kinds of words and blemishes, but that God loves you just as you are and gives you that. Because of that love and that opportunity to repent and to receive forgiveness and to be a child of his kingdom. Jesus humbled himself. He was the king of heaven. He comes down and takes the form of a man and lives a life like any human being would live. He got cold. He got thirsty. He got hungry. He got tired. He felt the pain of loss of loved ones. He went through all that we go through. And when he went through his passion, he did not bring back his divine power to keep himself from feeling all the pain of the flogging and the crown of thorns pushed cruelly down upon his sacred head. He didn't do anything to suddenly make himself the binding until he didn't feel the pain of the nails driven into his flesh. But he felt every bit of that. Even refusing to take the drink that was offered to him that would have dulled his senses so that he wouldn't have felt the pain so much. That's because he had a mind of humility. He was willing to be humble for our salvation. 
hope most of you here remember who Dr. Albert Schweitzer was. Dr. Albert Schweitzer grew up in Europe, was brilliant, was a brilliant organist, church organist. He had a degree in theology. He became a medical doctor and felt the call to go to Africa to witness to our Lord Jesus Christ and to bring modern medicine to the continent of Africa. When he arrived, he discovered a shortage of manpower, so he had to do a lot of manual labor himself. Again, Dr. Schweitzer was a man known all over Europe and in, in America. He had written a, uh, a book that had set the theological world on fire, the historical Jesus. And here he is in Africa doing manual labor, labor in order to make his hospital a success. One day a Canadian visitor came to see Dr. Schweitzer so that he could go back to Canada and report about his work and all he had done. And when he arrived, he expected to find Dr. Schweitzer in the hospital with a white coat on and going around the, the visiting patients or that he would be in the operating room doing surgery or treating someone for a sprained ankle or some such thing. But instead, as he arrived and was taken to where Dr. Schweitzer was, he found him pushing a wheelbarrow and was totally shocked. And he said, how can you, Dr. Schweitzer, be pushing a wheelbarrow without stopping? Dr. Schweitzer simply replied, with both hands. <laughs> See, Dr. Schweitzer, with all of his fame, with all of his ability, musically and theologically, it was not too much for him to do manual labor like anyone else. And he would, he would pitch in to keep the hospital going. <clears throat> so we are to have that kind of mind. Mind, first of all, of humility. Second, we must have a mind of service. As St. Paul tells us in the seventh verse, speaking of Jesus, but he emptied himself, taking the form of a slave. Taking the form of a slave, not of a king. You read Greek mythology, Roman mythology, and you read about the gods coming down to earth. They don't come down as slaves. They don't come down as servants. They come down as a god or goddess. And they come down to have their purpose fulfilled, whatever that might be, and they go back up to Mount Olympus without any problems, without suffering, without identifying with the human race. Jesus came taking the form of a slave. That phrase means, quote, one who gives himself up for another. In the world. As followers of Jesus, we are to be willing to give ourselves up for another. That we are willing, like Dr. Swift, not to cling to some type of society recognition that would say, oh, you're too high of a person, you shouldn't do that. But instead, it's that willingness to serve that other person, even if it means you take on a lower capacity. Jesus, as he tells us many times in the gospel, came to serve and not to be served. After he fed the 5,000 and wanted to make him a king, he withdrew, so that couldn't happen. They did not understand what Jesus' mission was. Even his own disciples, following him for three years, couldn't get it through their thick skulls that he was not there to be a military messiah. He was not there to be another King David and set up Israel as the greatest power in the Mediterranean world. He was there to be the messiah of the prophets, the suffering servant. The one who comes to serve us all so that we might be with him and live with him in his kingdom. St. Paul tells us also he emptied himself. That means to lay aside your position or lay aside uh, your prestige or honors. It means to 
deprive yourself of your force or your power. It means to seem to be empty of any value. Remember when Jesus was before Pilate, and Pilate was asking him if he were a king. And Jesus responded with words to the effect of, if he were an earthly king, his followers would not have let him ever been handed over to Pilate. And he also told Pilate that if he were to be an earthly king, he could call to his father and he would send him 12 legions of angels to defend him and to establish his kingdom. 12 legions of angels, roughly a legion depending on the time period, legions were about 6,000 men at arms. So you're talking about 72,000 angels. Not an army on earth, even today, that could take on 72,000 angels. No matter how sophisticated we might be. And so Jesus was emphasizing he came to serve. And as his followers, we are to do likewise. And then the third mind we must have, if we are to have the mind of Christ, is to have a mind of sacrifice. As we read, Jesus was obedient even to giving his name. Obedient means to give an ear to. It's similar to an officer giving an order to a subordinate, and the subordinate immediately carries out the order because he gives a lot of weight to what he is hearing. He takes that order seriously. So to give an ear to something means to give a lot of honor to it, a lot of prestige to it, to a lot of response to it. So Jesus took up his cross and suffered and died that first good Friday so that we might be his own and live under him in his kingdom. We are to do the same. We are to take up our cross for Jesus Christ to be willing to sacrifice no matter what that sacrifice might be. Sometimes it means sacrificing our lives. Proclaiming Jesus Christ as Lord. As we've seen countless martyrs in the Middle East building over the past eight, nine years with the scourge of ISIS going through. We also have martyrs being made every day in North Korea, Iran, Sudan, Nigeria and other countries in the world. Christians are persecuted. Or we may sacrifice, have to sacrifice our time. Or we may have to sacrifice our talent. Or we may have to sacrifice our treasure. We don't know what kind of sacrifice we might, might be called upon to do, but we are to have that mind of sacrifice, a willingness to sacrifice on behalf of Jesus Christ and His church. On behalf of Jesus Christ and spreading the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ to others, no matter who they might be. When I was first ordained, the first parish I served was Christ Luther Church in Evansville, Indiana. And there was a couple there who were just beginning to enter their 80s while I was there. And I was told an interesting story about them. Uh, and that was that they had never bought life insurance, even though they had been encouraged. And the reason they had never bought life insurance was because they didn't want to take the cost of the premium away from giving it to Jesus Christ and his church. So they went without life insurance, trusting that Jesus would take care of it. There wouldn't be any kind of disaster where they would have needed it. And for them, it worked out. They lived, both lived to be something like 89 years old. Um, but I'm not saying I don't buy life insurance. I don't get life insurance. People mad at me. But that's just an example of someone who felt called to sacrifice them. They felt they were called to give that money instead to the church. And when we have that kind of mind, then divisions and problems within the church do become less problematic, less divisive. 
and less powerful. So we can disagree as Christians, and as Christians have and still do throughout the years. But in so doing, we are to disagree with that mind of Christ, with that mind of humility, that mind of service, and that mind of sacrifice. church can be avoided, not to our glory, but to the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. We will now sing, Precious Lord, Take My Hand, hymn number 773, and just a little Note about the hymn, you will notice at the bottom it will say it's written by Thomas Dorsey. That is not Tommy Dorsey, the big band <laughs> swinger. There was, believe it or not, on the internet some years ago, a story going around about how Tommy Dorsey and the big band here had written Precious Lord Take My Hand. I bet it was. It was a a uh, man who's called the father of gospel, American gospel, African American uh, musician and singer up in Chicago, uh, wrote this song uh, and it became very popular. I know mean, the first time I heard it was Tennessee Henry Ford, and hearing him sing it, I fell in love with it. I've <coughs> listened to it ever since by Tennessee Henry Ford version. But uh, this was written by a Christian. Musician and choir director in Chicago, not a big band, Tommy Dorsey. <laughs> band director. So, Precious Lord, take my hand, 777. This hymn was written by Thomas Dorsey in 1932. He's the son of a black, black revivalist preacher. He received word that his wife had died. And he was inspired then, sitting at the piano, to write this hymn, Precious Lord Take My Hand. His wife he had just learned had died and his newborn son had died. He was then able to write this song to get some relief from his sadness at the loss of his wife. Thomas H. Dorsey, he was son of a black revivalist preacher.
seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We wake in one home. for our offering. Our ushers are Bill and Harry Nevius. We'll be coming forward, taking up the offering here. This is St. John's Lutheran Church, Springfield, Ohio. We have services at 8 o'clock on every Sunday at 1030. We invite you to come join us at any time. Today we have Holy Communion. We receive Jesus Christ. We believe in the real presence. We believe that we will be enriched and served by that. We have the mind of Christ as pastor talked in the sermon. Uh, the mind of humility, the mind of service, the mind of sacrifice, as long as we have that, we won't have any disagreement. We have to settle on that. Our other people who are helping with worship today and communion service, Becky Dimitrov, worship assistant, reader, Linda Smith, Sally Baker, communion assistant, Bill and Mary Nevius are the ushers. We invite you to come anytime to our church. We always have our services, eight o'clock on Sunday morning, except during the summer, we're at, we're at the Melody Cruise in drive-in. 10.30 services every Sunday. I invite you to come worship with us. Receive Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit within Holy Communion as we believe in the real presence of Christ in Holy Communion. We're happy that we have the flowers today that are brought to us in the memory of Russell Mittman's birthday. 
Becky Dimitrov, in loving memory of Russ Minton's birthday, the flowers on the chancel stand. Anonymous in honor of Nelson Klopfen's son's birthday. Nelson is in his 90s. We're happy to have him here today. We honor him as happy birthday, Nelson Klopfenstein. Becky Dimitrov, in loving memory of Russ Mittman's birthday. Russ has deceased. He served on Iwo Jima, World War II veteran. Very good member of this church. His family is still serving St. John's Church. We're happy to have you worship here, and we want you to come anytime to be of service to Jesus Christ as God commands us to worship him. He wants us here in his house. His life giving passion and death, his 
glorious resurrection and ascension, and the promise of his coming again, we give thanks to you, O Lord God Almighty, not as we ought, but as we are able. We ask you mercifully to accept our praise and thanksgiving, and with your word and Holy Spirit, to bless us, your servants, and these your own gifts of bread and wine, so that we and all who share in the body and blood of Christ may be filled with heavenly blessing and grace, and receiving the forgiveness of sin, may be formed to live as your holy people, and be given our inheritance with all your saints. To O God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be our honor and glory in your holy church, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us praise Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. 
We thank God that we received the sacrament of His body and blood. He is within us. We believe that He will be within us. Help us all through the week as we can come to Him at any time. He's promised never to leave us, never to leave us alone. Here He is now with us. Two or three are gathered together in His name, and we receive the sacrament of His body and blood in His holy time. This hymn was written by an English woman, <coughs> Catherine Hankey. She was a champion of abolishing slavery and also a champion of missions. Those were the things that she loved. I love to tell the story, a very famous hymn, written in 1866 by an English woman, Catherine Hankey. Her brother was a missionary and she was a champion for abolishing slavery and for missions.
Thank you for worshiping with us. We invite you to listen to us, watch us on YouTube at any time. Please pass the word out, evangelize. Pass the word to other people that we're on. Ask them to listen. They can receive Jesus Christ through the Sacrament of Holy Communion. You can receive it and watching the YouTube and God will be with you. And ask Jesus to be the Lord of your life. We ask you to do this. We have our services, 8 o'clock, Sunday morning, 10.30. We have a youth group going today to the Young Church Dairy. So we invite the youth to come to our church. And then uh, November the 1st, we have ice skating and lunch at the Chiller at 12.30 p.m. right after church. We invite you to come to the youth group. Youth must attend church service today of the event. Happy to have you with us today. We'll be going to Young Church Dairy after church. Thank you for worshiping with us. We will pray for you. Please pray for us. Pray for our mission. Pray that St. John's will still be around for a long, many years to minister to the downtown. We serve 8,000 meals a month to those who are in need. Anyone can come to the Rainbow Table on Friday afternoon who needs a meal. We invite you to come. We have our outreach store. We have many, many volunteers who are here to help the poor. We thank you for watching us. We invite you to come watch us again anytime on YouTube.